Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, everyone here um, joining with us today. My name is Sunny Kim. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Harriman Institute um, in Columbia University. Uh, we're having an ongoing speaker series event, The Role of Law in Autocracy, the Legal Dimension of Russian Politics. The speaker series invite prominent scholars to share their expertise and insight on the intersection between the legal institutions and Russian politics. For more information about this event, you can visit the Harriman Institute website and also for previous lectures and presentations of this speaker series event, you can also watch from the um, Harriman Institute uh, YouTube channel. So for today's talk, it is my uh, great honor to invite Dr. Catherine Hendley, Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Her research focuses on legal reform in Russia with a particular emphasis on how ordinary Russians experience law. Uh, Dr. Hentley's work has appeared in a wide variety of peer review journals and law reviews. Her most recent work focuses on the um, Russian legal profession based on an uh, analysis of a recent survey of Russian law students on the cusp of graduation. Uh, for today's talk, Dr. Hentley will share with us her research on uh, the topic of judicial independence in authoritarianism, especially focusing on how Russians perceive the judiciary, judicial independence, depending on their different experience with the legal system and depending on social and economic backgrounds. Um, as usual, followed by the presentation, we will have a Q&A and discussion session. If you have any questions or comments during the talk, uh, feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom and I'll be moderating those comments and questions. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Hentley. Uh, thank you again for joining here with us. Uh, you can take the floor. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. I think I have shared my screen, haven't I? Have I shared it or not? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So I want to thank Sun Yi for the invitation. It's great to be part of such a wonderful lineup of scholars. Uh, I want to thank Carly for the organizational work and making everything so easy. Um, this is a new project for me. It uh, builds on some other things that I've been doing. Uh, and as Sun Yi mentioned, I'm looking at the question of judicial independence, um, but not so much whether they have it or not, but just whether Russians think they have it or not. And so the bottom up approach to uh, uh, judicial um, uh, independence. Uh, so I'm very interested in getting a lot of feedback here. Um, as everyone tuning in can probably guess, we could spend the whole time just debating what is judicial independence, how could it possibly exist in an authoritarian uh, system. This is the preoccupation of the literature. This is not my preoccupation, so we're doing something uh, different today. So we're going to sort of bracket that question of what is judicial independence uh, and move on to the, uh, the question of what do people think about judicial independence. But before we go there, I wanted to just say a few things about the whole idea of even contemplating uh, judicial independence in an authoritarian context. Um, I think it's fair to say that the mainstream social science literature tends to almost dismiss courts in um, authoritarian countries. Certainly that's true of a lot of political scientists uh, that, that aren't law people um, in Russia. Um, and I was listening yesterday to a webinar that Lubov Sobol was giving, uh, and she just flat out says there is no independence of courts in Russia. And she also went on to say it would be so easy to create independence, which I think is a whole separate, that's a whole separate discussion. But but the point is, is that many people, both inside Russia and uh, social scientists studying Russia, would just say that, you know, we should just not even, it's not even an issue. But the reality is, is there's a, a pretty interesting literature on the whole question of whether, you know, how courts think about independent, how we should think about independence in authoritarian countries. And it uses this framework that I know Peter Solomon had talked about a little bit earlier in the series about dualism. Uh, and it looks at different ways of thinking about uh, dualism. We have some work on Egypt and Singapore and even China that says, well, maybe the courts are uh, trying to, to create a receptive environment for foreign investment and so forth. They, therefore, they treat those cases differently. Uh, we know that in the Russian case, 
case, it's a story of uh, uh, politicized cases or cases where people have power. And that was the, uh, the theme of uh, Peter Solomon's uh, discussion. And I'm not going to uh, rehash that. But uh, the one thing I did want to just uh, start with is a couple of data points here. So, you know, here we see Levada data on uh, the evolution of trust in different institutions. And we could look at the court uh, piece there and we could say, oh, look at that. They're marching upwards. But look at the end. The end point is that less than a third of Russians uh, have full trust in court. So that's that's really not a very positive story. Um, but the other thing we have to recognize is, uh, and I think this is a, a fallacy that drives a lot of the, the mainstream literature, is people assume, well, if you don't trust the court, then you're not going to use it. And um, some of you may know that I've written about this elsewhere, but, but the reality is, is that at the same time we don't have a lot of trust, we can see that the, that the use of the courts has uh, increased uh, over time. Um, and, and I'm not, you know, there are lots of reasons why people use courts, and that's not our topic for today either. Um, but the, the one thing I do want to make sure that we all are on board with is the, that some people look at this and they say, oh, well, you know, you see a story of repression there. They're just going after people. And that's not the story here. The story here is of mostly the increase in um, civil cases, uh, which are cases where people have to make the choice to go to court. Um, now, another thing to recognize is that even in civil cases, a lot of times people are there because they have they have to be there. You know, if you want to get divorced, if you want to deal with a property dispute, a lot of times the courts are the only way to do it. And so there's a lot of there's a lot going on um, in these data. Um, and I, I totally acknowledge that. OK, so here we're the question that we're interested in today is how do Russians make sense of the independence or lack of independence of their courts? And I'm going to approach this question by looking at the same question that was asked on two surveys, two different surveys, 10 years apart. So a 2008 survey and a 2018 survey. Uh, and here's the question. Uh, which of the following statements best describes your point of view, that judges are basically independent or judges are basically under the control or hard to say? Right now, we can. Uh, I'm sure that people will think, well, this isn't the best question. But the reality is, is that I didn't participate in that 2008 survey. Um, it was a survey uh, um, uh, done by Indem. Uh, but there it is. It's a question, and I thought, well, it's a pretty good question. So then, let I, I I put it on the 2018 RLMS survey. So let's just look at the basic results here. And I don't think this there's any uh, big surprise here that we see that a majority of of Russians uh, think that their courts are not independent. Um, but one of the things that is interesting here is that we see that the uh, percentage of people who think that it's becoming independent is increasing and that the people who are not taking a position is decreasing. Both of those, I think, are interesting, and we will look at both of them. Um, OK, I started already to get into some of the methodological challenges, but let me continue with that. Um, one problem is, is that these are two independent surveys, so it's not a panel survey. A 2008 survey was fielded by Indem. Uh, some of you may know this very interesting book that Indem produced by you know, Sotarov, Mishina, uh, Mishina, and other people were the authors of it that focused on some of the data, including they, you know that table that I just put up there. That data is in there. Um, but their, their, their survey was really about court reform. So tons and tons and tons of law-related questions, um, just a cornucopia of questions. It's just, just almost uh, too, too, too marvelous. Um, now, the 2018 uh, survey is the Russian Longitudinal Monitoring Survey, which is not a law survey. That is, is a survey about many, many different things. Um, it's really interested in demographic change. Uh, and the people that run it will uh, occasionally put on modules of questions about other issues. And so in 2018, I worked with them to put on a module of questions relating to law. Uh, and this was one of them. Um, so what what might be some of the, the noise, you know, some of the, the, the differences in the sample that might cause problems for us. Um, pretty, pretty similar in terms of gender and ethnic uh, uh, divisions. Um, uh, we have more uh, higher education and people with financial resources in the 2018 survey. Of course, the generational mix is going to change because 10 years uh, has, has passed. Um, of course, you know, one can always uh, beat themselves up about what the problems are in data. Um, and I have this wonderful colleague uh, who always 
tells me that you just do the best you can with what you've got. And that's the approach I've tried to take. And certainly that's the approach that we all have to take, whether we're doing qualitative or quantitative research uh, uh, based on Russia. Um, so that's the background here. And so I looked at uh, uh, three different lines of inquiry. Um, and this is not some kind of, uh, you know, perfect um, uh, model that I'm trying to create here. I'm just trying to start a discussion about what might be relevant here. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at, uh, at resources, uh, financial resources, looking at questions of experience, knowledge, and access to the courts, and then looking at the question of uh, sophistication regarding the legal system or naivete. Um, and I'm not going to give you all the, the uh, calculations that I've done, but just so that you know, I've done both cross tab, so looking at descriptive uh, approach to this. And then I did do uh, a series of uh, regressions where I'm able to put in all three options. So uh, uh, multinomial uh, regression on mlogit, right, where you have the three options. And I use the um, uh, being independent as the, the reference category. And you'll see, I don't I don't have the the coefficients or anything up here, but you'll see the the um, the results as I've tried to present them in a relatively simple way. Okay, so let's first start by talking about resources. So resources is a very common thing that legal scholars look at that uh, people who um, uh, are uh, um, have more money uh, have are able to hire better lawyers. This is not a thing that's unique to Russia by any means. And of course, the Russia case presents certain complications because of the, you know, we kind of have to weave in corruption. Right. Um, and the question of whether or not because you have an advantage because you know the system better, or you can hire people who know the system better, you know, that's unclear how that plays out in terms of judicial independence. Uh, and I'm still trying to think about what my results here uh, 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 means. But we see here that affluent and, uh, you know, I had to the the the, the variables that measure uh, um, class here are not perfect matches for each other, but we see that people who are in an affluent category, so they, they don't really have to worry about money, um, are significantly more likely uh, to believe that uh, Russian courts are more um, uh, independent. Right um, now, does that mean that they think they can buy the results? Does that mean that they think that they uh, that whatever is best for them, that because they can hire lawyers or in some way come out with results that are better for them? And we don't actually know that they've gotten results that are better for them. Um, but what we do see here is that this this result is uh, confirmed by the uh, regression analysis. Um, if we move on to this larger category of experience, knowledge, and access, uh, I think here education is one of the most interesting pieces of the puzzle. Um, so the same question that is in the 2008 and 2018 surveys, I also used on the um, survey that uh, Sunni mentioned that I did about uh, law students. Uh, so what we see here is that we can compare people that have legal education to people who have simply higher education or don't have higher education. Uh, of course, in the survey on legal education, we have only people that have higher education because that's the only, you know, we have no variation in that. Um, but what's interesting here is that the people who are on the cusp of graduating uh, from a law faculty, uh, they they believe about, it's about split. Uh, um, half of them believe in judicial independence, 38% uh, doubt it, and then we have a relatively small group, 13% that have no opinion. Um, the so, so that's that's radically different than what the, the results are for the, um, the general population. Right. Um, and so at first I thought, well, you know, people coming out of law school, they've got their rose colored glasses. They're thinking very positively about that. And so I was able to pull out the, the people who are lawyers in the 2018 survey. And here's the even split, you know, that, that um, about uh, 45 percent uh, on each side. And even that is radically um, different than the general population. I couldn't do it for the 2008 survey. There were just too few uh, um, lawyers in the sample. Um, so what we see here is that people who have uh, you know, close knowledge of the legal system, and we're going to come back to this when we look at uh, 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 use of the courts, um, that, that they tend to have a more positive view of the courts than do ordinary um ordinary Russians. And I'm not sure this is what you would think at, at first glance. You might think that the lawyers who are having to kind of get into the mud pit all the time, that they might have a very negative view um, of courts. The, the, the student story, I think, is easier 
easier to explain because they're right, you know, they're just being ejected from this, you know, socialization process. Um, and so to be honest, I was surprised at the results of the RLMS with the with the lawyer um, uh, respondents. And I would love to be able to test that in a larger um, sample of lawyers. Um, but when we compare that to people with uh, non-legal education, but higher education, uh, we see that people who have higher education are much more skeptical of uh, uh, the courts, of the independence of the courts, than are people without higher education. Um, and so that you know, that's also super interesting for us. Um, and on access, I looked at urban versus rural, and I think it's fair to say that people in urban areas have easier access to courts. Um, uh, the Justice of the Peace courts are, are fairly uh, uh, located in, in ways that are easy for people in cities to to, to get to. Um, but those folks are more likely to see the courts as dependent. So this is this idea of, of um, uh, more knowledge leading to less respect, right? More knowledge leading to uh, more skepticism about the courts. Um, but it really gets interesting when we look at court experience. Um, and, and here, this, in some ways, this tracks a paper that, that I had in post-Soviet affairs a few years ago, um, where I, I, I was looking not so much at the independence of courts, but just as people's, uh, you know, what they thought about courts after they had been to them and looking more at trust, I think, than independence. But here we see that the um, the, the respondents who had court experience, uh, they tend to be, uh, uh, have a, um, a more likely to think that judges are uh, dependent, um, also more likely to have an opinion. Right, which I think is interesting as well. So you come out of court, um, and when you're asked, do you think that the 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 that courts are um, are uh, um, uh, uh, dependent or independent? You know, they tend to err on the side of saying that they're dependent. People people that had no court experience follow with the the um, the sample more generally. And some of you might think, well, this is because they had a terrible experience in court, and and that's just not the truth, right? This is the other paper that I did, this 2016 post-Soviet affairs paper, um, where I looked at a Levada survey where they asked them like you know ten questions about their experiences in courts, and they were generally positive about that. In the RLMS uh, um, module, I couldn't ask them ten questions, but I could ask Ask them, you know, whether they thought that the judges had been impartial, and we see that three quarters of them believed that their judges had been impartial. But even so, they still were thinking that the courts were less uh, um, uh, uh, independent, right? Um, and we can see this more generally that uh, uh, in another part of the RLMS, I asked them about what are the potential obstacles to hiring lawyers. We had a four-point scale that they could use, and the um, uh, the people who were court users uh, tend to to be. Uh, um, uh, that, that, that their results are statistically different from uh, non-users and they tend to think on, be higher um, on, on this being an obstacle. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's an overall finding here and it's consistent with what I found in uh, interpreting this 2010 Levada survey. Um, so what we see here is that when we shift from looking at trust as I did in the 2016 paper and look at the question of independence, um, that even though you had a good experience in court, uh, you still come out of it thinking that the courts aren't independent. Right. And I don't know, you know, is this, a, you know, got too close to how the sausage is being made or 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 whatever. Um, but but it's certainly an interesting uh, uh, result. And I think um, we've seen this in, in some other places where in China, for example, uh, they have the same kind of uh, uh, result where people that have uh, used the courts are become they they use this idea of being enchanted with the courts. And they say that non users or have a have a enchantment with the courts. I don't think anybody in Russia is enchanted with the courts, So I don't like that. I like that term so much. Um, but the point is, is that maybe this this is something that is part of authoritarianism and something that we need to think more about. Um, so then when we look at trust, and here we're looking at people who are maybe uninformed about the, the courts. They're just, you know, general, what do you think about the courts? Um, and you see here that we're looking at people who had complete trust in the courts. The questions were asked differently, but there was a question about this uh, in both surveys. Um, of course, the in survey had questions about every kind of court, which was just fabulous. Like They didn't let me do that 
that on the RLMS. But so we just went with this general category of courts. Uh, and we see that people who have uh, complete trust in courts uh, tend to, to be higher. Uh, it, it bleeds over into what they think about uh, independence. Um, and I'm not sure that that's I don't I don't think that that's uh, terribly surprising. Um, there's a little bit of uh, overlap here in terms of the explanations, because the people who have identify as having high trust in courts are least less likely to have used the courts uh, than people who don't have uh, the high level of trust. That's sort of a whole separate question, but I thought that might come up. Uh, so I wanted just to 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 raise that and you know i think the question of of what is the dividing line between trusting in courts and believing in the independence of courts you know i don't know whether that can be pulled apart but maybe that's something we can get some uh debate about um so uh you know we see this uh puzzling role of trust right that uh we see here we see in other studies that trust doesn't drive use Right, um, and here you get to that uh, uh, that that point about China that I was making earlier. That they talk about this idea of uninformed enchantment of those who haven't used the courts. Uh, as I say, I'd like to get away from that uh, enchantment idea, but I think the un uninformed piece uh, is one that uh, is 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 perhaps interesting for us. Um, and I think it's fair to say that maybe trust is a driver of attitudes and not of behavior. Right. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is interesting is that uh, the use of courts doesn't lead to respect for courts. Uh, and here, when we look at the comparative data, we see that 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 there are different outcomes. You know, as I mentioned in in China, they they find the same sort of thing. Uh, in the United States, uh, they find that using the courts tends to lead to uh, greater respect for them in terms of trust and in terms of belief in their independence. Um, and I think the, the, the other thing that, that comes into here is that we see a very interesting illustration of how important socialization or, you know, kind of intense knowledge about an institution, uh, uh, can the role that that can play in terms of driving attitudes about that institution. Um, I honestly had thought that this was something that was going to disappear. And one of the reasons I had wanted to do, uh, you know, multiple rounds of this survey, uh, not just because I wanted to study the, the um, uh, kind of the career progression of Russian lawyers, uh, but also because I thought th this, this was going to disappear, this effect was going to disappear and uh, lawyers going to, were going to look more like the rest of the population. Um, and as I mentioned before, the RLMS is not a perfect way to study this because there's a, a relatively small cohort of lawyers uh, in, the, in the sample. Um, but it is interesting that the fact that they have deeply, uh, they, they, they could, if, if we look at informed versus uninformed, they are informed consumers of court services. Uh, and they have, uh, they're willing to see the, the potential for um, uh, independence there. Uh, and so I think that's very interesting uh, uh, to us as well. Um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the question of why it is that um, people, laymen who use the courts uh, 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 kind of emerge as being less less trustful of them, less, uh, less of le uh, uh, lower levels of belief in their independence. I think there's a couple things that can, can be going on here. And this is just not the topic uh, of the paper, but just kind of speculation at the end here. Um, one is the whole sausage being made that, that people can be um, uh, troubled by what they see. Um, I tend to not give that as much sway as, as I think a lot of people would simply because the, the um, you know, the 2010 Levada survey that marched through all the kind of indicators of procedural justice, all the ways that you could be treated badly, whether by the staff, by the in, uh, implementation of the opinion, treated by the court, uh, and, and so on and so on. All of those people came away fairly positive about them. Um, as someone who's spent, uh, you know, a huge amount of time watching uh, courts and watching people experience the court experience, um, I think that, that perhaps uh, one of the things that we don't pay enough attention to is how the experience is received by someone who doesn't really have any knowledge of what's going on. Um, Russian judges are super positivistic, right, in the sense that, you know, they're not really interested in, in arguments based on equity. Uh, they just want to know, you know, do you line up with what the law says? 
Um, and here I'm talking about mundane cases. I'm not dealing with uh, politicized cases. Uh, and certainly I've seen lots of examples where people come away just completely flummoxed that they have, you know, it's just outrageous to them what's happened to them. But the judge you know, it just is that's how the that's how the cookie crumbles in terms of the law. Um, and some judges are, are are willing to stop and explain that. Um, but the other thing that's going on here is that judges are under this incredible time pressure to push things along. Right. I mean, Pomorsky has this wonderful article about when he observed uh, criminal courts in the early 2000s about the need for speed. You know, they're judged on whether or not they they have uh, delays. And so the their their willingness, their ability to stop and, you know, kind of bring everybody along with them is limited. And I can understand how you could come away from that thinking, you know, these people don't care about me at all. Right. Um, and still think that the decision was was somehow fair. Right. Um, well, anyway, I'll close with that, and I welcome questions and thoughts about whether or not this is an interesting topic or not, and, and so on. Okay, thank you for your presentation and sharing us, uh, sharing with us your uh, recent research and um, findings on the um, perception of the judicial independence in Russia. Um, okay, so maybe I, I'll start with the uh, kind of a general question that I had um, hearing from you. Uh, from your presentation, um, I was I j I'm just interested in the like this black box where okay the users of the court they have they tend to have positive maybe experience overall but that does not really necessarily link towards the positive attitude or the um, perception on the positive perception on the judicial independence and what would be. Uh, the cause of that, what would be the mechanism of okay, how the link between the actual experience does not really link to the positive perception and belief in the judicial system. Uh, what, like, for my understanding, is it because I think um, we can really talk about this different um, possibilities of this whole uh, black box function, like why people do not really link their experience to uh, the independence of the judicial system. Do you think it is because maybe the overall political settings of um, the perceived corruption of the bureaucrats, just this disbelief in the whole authoritarian institutions by people, or more maybe like concrete um, disbelief in the judges or the legal and the judicial system itself. I just want to um, uh, understand. Yeah. Like, to be honest, I'm not sure it's any of those things. Uh, it could be a little bit of all of it. But one of the things that comes through when I would do focus groups or talk to people is the, the uh, emotional energy that it takes people to go to court. Right. Mm -hmm. How they they feel like, oh, you know, it's just so scary to do this. And so um, I think that some of that is just that it's so overwhelming for them, the whole idea. And that goes not to the fact that it's an authoritarian regime or anything like that, because I think that the vast majority of people as they're interacting with the judicial system. You know, the fact that Russia is an authoritarian system doesn't really play into to what's going on there. You know, if they're getting a divorce or they have a neighbor that's bothering them or, you know, they have a problem at work. Um, that's not something that the regime really cares about. Uh, and instead, it's the, you know, kind of some of the the institutional makeup of the of the courts, the way that that it's a civil service and the, the judges have certain kind of markers that they have to hit in terms of their performance. Uh, and that may uh, create um, an impression of you know, I don't, I don't know, it's hard to say because when they're asked, do they feel like the judge respected them? They generally say yes. So I'm reluctant to say that they feel disrespected by the judges, but that it just is such an overwhelming kind of thing. Um, and so I think that's part of it. Um, I, 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 and maybe there is some, some piece of the corruption uh, 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 story there too. Um, but one of the things that I think we always need to remember is that the vast majority of cases that are heard in the Russian courts are it's a, such low stakes. Right. They're, they're, most of the cases that are heard in Russian courts would never get to the court in any in any other country. Right. Um, and uh, that's a whole you know, that's a whole interesting question in and of itself that um, and uh, it's a little bit of a of, of a, uh, um, a vicious circle, because the fact that they have to speed through these cases is a direct result of the fact that lots of cases that don't really need to be in court are in court. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so I don't know whether that's a good answer to your question, but I don't see a lot of high politics in this mm -hmm. um, 
but I'm willing to be uh, um, convinced otherwise, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay. Um, we have, uh, maybe we can give the chance, uh, the audience to speak up if sh she's willing. Um, Lu Lucia Cannon? You want me to allow them to turn on their microphones um, to ask questions? Well, there is this question in the chat. Do you want me to answer that one? Okay, let's go with the, um, yeah. I mean, she, she, so it says here that I think it's from Dennis Savalyov. Judges can be relatively independent in a case where a person sues a peer person or a private business sues a peer business, but not as equally independent in a case where the state or some corrupt organization like Ross Neft are involved. So respondents can have different opinions depending on what independence they mean. Um, the, the, the starting assumption was is that I'm not actually talking about politicized cases. I'm not talking about cases where the state State. Well, I'm talking about cases involving the state, but um, not where you have big players or where the state has an active interest in how the uh, what the result is. Not these kind of um, you know business disputes where partners are going after each other. The kind of cases that that Peter Solomon was talking about. Um, and if the point here is is that it's hard to know exactly what kind of case um, someone has been involved in, you know that's a that's a that's a that's true, and that has to be acknowledged. But we also take uh, the reality is is that you know this is a hard thing to know. But I would say you know probably ninety five percent of the cases that are resolved by the Russian courts do not are not in this category that we spend so much time thinking and worrying about. If you just look at the the um, percentage of cases in which people use sudebni uh, prikazi or judicial orders where you don't have a hearing on the merits. Right. Um, that's a huge percentage of cases. And those are not cases where, you know, there's really anybody that has a big those are cases that never should even be in court. Right. Um, and that kind of goes against uh, this idea, the, the thing that you were raising, Sunya, about the the, you know, the fact that they're worried about corruption or something like that. And even, you know, my argument about the um, uh, the the, um, you know, kind of the effort that's needed. That would still play out in a bit because you still have to figure out the paperwork and all that. I mean, I think those of us that study the Russian courts are always like amazed at how easy they make it to 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 use the courts. That you have these websites that give you the, you know, the 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 forms and all that kind of stuff. But of course, I'm not a Russian, right? So for me to say as a as a as a trained lawyer to say, well, that looks super easy to me. You know, I'm not a. It could still be very very um, scary for them to do that. And the fact that so many people that go to the justice of the peace courts go still go. Well, I guess not now with the with the pandemic, but uh, uh, often went in to do the priomni uh, chasi to the office hours to talk with staff and stuff about what to do suggests that they're you know they find it intimidating. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that may be disappointing that I'm not talking about those kind of cases, but that is the, uh, uh, the reality. And the idea that the um, financial resources do not produce independence in a situation where the state can confiscate it. Again, the, uh, I think Dennis is thinking about a situation that is not really part of my, my story, right? Mm -hmm. um, that I don't think that when people come to court to get divorced or that they come, and that's what you know, the, if you look at the, the pie chart of what the cases are there, you know, family law cases, housing cases, other things like that. And those are not the kind of cases where anyone's, uh, anyone's resources are going to be confiscated by the state. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, here we're dealing with individuals. So we're not even in the world of the arbitrage courts where you might be able to have uh, a situation where somebody's resources would be confiscated. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, um, a question from Lucia Kennan. Um, uh, so it's about the question about the judges, whether they were former communists and lawyers or former communists, do you think these kind of party lines would um, differentiate the results or maybe they were independent of current officials? So like the qualification of the judges, the individual judges, um, do you think it uh, matters in inducing some kind of trust or non-trust? Well, I don't think the average Russian knows what the qualifications of judges are. So I'm skeptical that that has any impact on their uh, opinion of them. Um, and the reality is, is that the data doesn't speak to that. So I can't test for, you know, what the background of judges are. Uh, there's been a pretty 
complete turnover since the Soviet period of judges and, uh, um, uh, you know, an effort to try to professionalize, not a perfect effort, for sure, uh, the, the qualification commissions have proven to be quite willing to dance to the tune of the regime when they want to get rid of a passion or a, uh, another judge that causes them problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, here we're getting into micro level analyses that the kind of data that I have don't allow for. Um, you know, the book that I did on everyday law in Russia uh, did get into some of this kind of stuff about, uh, you know, how justices of the peace think about their, their role and whether or not they're willing to, you know, kind of uh, rock the boat. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, there I made an argument. I don't think it's because of their political affiliations. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think the, the story there is very similar to stories in Japan or uh, any country that has a, a judiciary that's a civil on a service, civil service model, which is the you know, countries with a civil law tradition, is that their goal is to move up in the system. And, and they don't do that by, you know, being the person that uh, refuses to convict Navalny. You know, they do that by being the person that goes along, right? Um, and uh, in the, and, and of course, I'm not my, my my data does not include the Navalny-like kind of case. But let me just give you an example. So, you know, in the book, I talk about a, an example of a woman who's coming in to get uh, um, child support, and she argues that her husband has lowballed his uh, income. Uh, un, under Russian law, you get 25 percent of your uh, your ex spouse's uh, income, and that he has. Uh, you know, kind of pretended like he quit his job and now he has an income that gives him a very minimal amount. And she's able to show that he goes on, you know, kind of uh, uh, really lavish vacations and has credit card receipts for all this. But what she doesn't have is a tax receipt, right? And the judge says, well, I'm sorry, but without that tax receipt, there's nothing that I can do for you, right? Why does she do that? Because she's afraid of being overturned on appeal. That's what she tells me afterwards. She says, I totally believe that woman, but I'm not going to do that because I'm going to get overturned on appeal. And the unspoken uh, uh, next step was, is that, well, then when they look to see who they're going to promote to be a district court judge, you know, it's not going to be me, right? That's going to be, I mean, one of the things that I think is is hard for those of us who grow up in a common law system to grasp is that reversals are mistakes in this system. Reversals are black marks on your record. Uh, that's not how we look at them, right? We think tough cases, you can get it wrong or pe- uh, people can disagree on things. Um, so I think that's the story, not their political affiliations. Mm-hmm. Um, now, again, this would be a totally, totally different argument if we were talking about politicized cases. Mm-hmm. In politicized cases, it's it's very clear that they they channel those to people uh, to judges that they can uh, they can count on, right? And and that probably has a lot to do uh, with their political affiliations. Uh, maybe Lucia wants to ask a question herself. Maybe she can ask a follow up question. Um, Uh, thank you. Mm-hmm. I, I just would like to say that I was in a court in Poland for eight years. And so I know the judicial system there very well. And it is dominated by communists, both judges and lawyers. I was robbed of my inheritance by an employee of the court who was an expert to the one of the main judges in Warsaw. And uh, he stole a piece of land that belonged to my grandmother that is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this is very common. This is especially common of all the emigrants, but it's also quite common among people in Poland that we are robbed by judges and, and, and their employees. I was in court, the corruption that is going on, every time they would, uh, you know, if the judge made a decision in my favor, it would be, uh, they would bring another judge from another district to reverse the decision. Every time I appealed, I had to pay a fee of $150, $200. When people in Poland earn $1,000 a month, I had to pay every time. I spent thousands and thousands of dollars. I was robbed by half of my lawyers. So this system is totally corrupt, and I do not believe it is any better in Russia. 
Well, let me just say how sorry I am for your experience in Poland. And, uh, uh, but I, I, I do think it is somewhat different in Russia. For one thing, the kind of case that you have would not be brought uh, in, in a Russian um, uh, setting. We don't have that kind of restitution of, of property that was denied to people. Um, no, no, and, no, it was not denied. It was, I in, uh, inherited it. So it no, was okay, denied. okay, so I yeah. I inherited it and the guy faked documents. He faked documents in order to uh, they claim that I was lost, you know, and my family that we were lost, and he assigned it to himself. And then mm -hmm. I was I caught it in time, and I was trying to prove that I exist. Uh, that uh, uh, basically I had a five-year window to prove that I exist and that I have a claim on the property, and I proved it. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you know, it was constantly reversed. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I'm sorry that the inheritance case uh, turned out so badly for you and that there was so much corruption involved in that. And I don't doubt that we could find uh, uh, cases like that in, in the Russian setting as well. Um, you know, my research suggests that that is not the norm. Um, and I certainly welcome other people to go into the courts and uh, prove me wrong. Um, but uh, the, the, certainly the amount that was involved in your case makes it a very, would make it a very unusual usual case uh, in the Russian setting. Okay, um, thank you for the input from Lucia and her experience. Um, and let's move on to the next question asked by Renata Mustafina. Uh, um, is there a possibility to differentiate in the survey the experience that people had of criminal courts and the experience of civil courts? And how do your findings resonate with your more qualitative research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't done that yet, Renata. Thanks for the question. Uh, but I think I could do it in both uh, both surveys. That's a great idea to see to see how that would play out. I'm I'm a little bit fearful that the number of criminal cases would be too small to make it significant, you know. But but we could do I could at least do a cross tab of that. That's a great idea because certainly in the Indem survey they you know they ask all kinds of detailed questions and I did get them to put that onto the RLMS. You know what kind of case you had. So that's a great idea. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So do we have another one, another question from chat or did we answer that? Uh, we got one on YouTube uh, that I just put into the chat. Okay. A uh, question from uh, Rihanna and Dowling. This is so fascinating. Thank you. I would love if you could talk about how these findings compare to perceptions within our system, thinking of the US in particular, where I would think um, that many uh, justice involved people might say decisions are fundamentally unfair or biased, but not because of independence. So maybe you can compare the unfair judgment and verdicts uh, and the trust and the, the difference between. Okay. Um, uh, so I talked a little bit about this, but there's a really wonderful paper. It's a little bit dated now, but uh, a paper that uh, Bert Kritzer did with a co-author where he looked at the U.S. system. And I think the title of the paper is, uh, you know, familiarity breeds respect. Right. So he's making the argument that the more uh, th that if you've used the court, then your respect for the court, including your your view of its independence, uh, uh, tends to, to to be burnished. Right. Um, uh, now, it'd be great to see something more recent. Um, and to be honest, I haven't you know, I haven't made this uh, explicitly comparative paper, so I can't speak to a, to, to a lot of different countries. Uh, the other group of scholars that have looked at this in some detail are the people studying China. Uh, and as I mentioned, there, the pattern there is very similar to what I found in Russia, that people who have used the courts tend to, 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 to um, uh, have a lower opinion of them afterwards, even if they felt like they were treated fairly uh, in their case, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a you know, that's something that, that I discuss with the with my colleagues who work on China. We try to figure out, you know, what's really going on here. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the U.S. story is one where, um, you know, we, we worry about politicized cases. And, and as we all have seen vividly in, you know, recent months and years is that, that whether or not you can get yourself a decent lawyer in, in the U.S. just 
is the whole ball game, right? And so, um, you know, that's where this hypothesis about resources comes from. Uh, mm -hmm. This idea that a very famous article called the haves come out ahead. And the idea of haves is not just about money. It's also about being able to tap into uh, um, deep knowledge about how the judicial system works. And that can come from lawyers or from your own experience or other things. And that they're, you know, able to show that uh, people and companies who uh, are experienced or have people who are experienced just, you know, do better. And uh, that speaks to the dualism within the U.S. legal system, mm -hmm. right, that's driven by resources. Uh, lawyers are becoming more important in the Russian case, but I think still are, you know, not the, the, the critical um, element, at least in mundane cases. Certainly having a good lawyer in a politicized case can make a difference as, as we saw in the, you know, in the Pussy Riot case where when the one of the defendants switched lawyers, she was able to um, work herself into a suspended sentence. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, I would like to ask uh, another question on the um, lawyer's perspective on the judicial system overall. And I think maybe this question more uh, leaning towards uh, this current presentation. Um, uh, than um, your like recent work on the legal profession. Uh, I believe that lawyers, because like they're all socialization in their own education that would lean, leaning towards a positive uh, perspective on the judicial system. Um, do you find in your research maybe that law, like when they uh, have their legal education, are their career choices um, tend towards become uh, the bureaucrats in the judicial systems like judges, is there more attractive career choice because maybe it, it, they can be more influential in making the whole like, like um, well, one of the things that, uh, that that I've written about is that we see a clear differentiation in this 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 population that I was studying between people who are interested in going into state service and people who are going into the private sector, that they differ dramatically on a whole series of, of uh, indicators, including their attitudes towards the courts. So I don't have it on this set of slides, but I have a slide that where we look at the, you know, we split out this population between people who are going into private practice versus people who are going into the state service and people who are going into the state service come into it with a higher opinion of courts right mm -hmm. a, a greater belief in their independence uh um a greater belief in the you know kind of the upstandingness of the chairman of the courts we ask questions about that um and the thing that that i would love to be able to do is to see how that split and see i can't do that with the the data that i have i can't split in the rlms or in the in uh, uh i can't split it between different kinds of lawyers like i can for the 2016 survey um so the the thing that's interesting about the 2016 survey is that it shows that uh, people who are going into state service, they aren't, you know, kind of this, this whole idea of how the, the prosecutors and the judges and, you know, that they're all on one big team. You know, this is a big argument that we've seen dating back to the Soviet period about how they all were kind of pulling on the same oar. Um, mm -hmm. And that's deeply troubling from a rule of law perspective. Uh, and people have always said, well, you know, that's just a result of being put into this bureaucracy. Right. And the thing that my data suggests is that, well, of course, the incentives within the bureaucracy are going to be relevant, but they come in, you mm -hmm. know, with that way of thinking. Right. Mm -hmm. Just like Advocati and uh, other people who are in the private sector uh, are attracted to uh, 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 parts of the legal profession where they can challenge judges, where they they're more skeptical of whether a, uh, um, a judge is going to follow the lead of their chairman. Right. They're more suspicious of that kind of thing than people who are in the state sector. I think I went a little bit astray from your question, but I hope that that's 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 uh, helpful in thinking about that. Um, uh, I mean, one of the things that I've always tr find troubling about the literature, the Russian literature on the legal profession is that it's so balkanized. Right. So that we have people that study uh, Sladovatoli, we have people that study Prokhodorti and so on. But um, the reality is, is that, that the these rigid uh, dividing lines that we had between all of these subparts of the legal profession are much more porous now. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I started this project on the on studying uh, lawyers, I wanted to study people that were out there practicing, but mm -hmm. there's no way to find them. 
right? Because they don't, you know, the, 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 there's a ton of these studies in the United States and you can do it because everybody has to take a bar exam. And so therefore you have, you know, some place to gather your people. And in Russia, you don't have that. And that's why, you know, everybody studies the advocati because mm -hmm. you can find them. Right. It's very hard to, to, you know, once they're out in the wild uh, to find notaries, to find uh, and to get them to agree to participate. Super expensive to try to track them all down. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another reason why I would love to be able to go back to this sample that I that we built in 2016 and, uh, you know, ask them again, sort of how they're doing, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, people in their 20s aren't necessarily people in their 40s. Right. In terms of their attitudes and their behaviors and stuff. Um, so. Okay, maybe um, one final question coming from me and the uh, maybe it resonates with the whole uh, theme of the uh, speaker series. Uh, in the course of your research, uh, did you get a sense of how this politicized cases impact on the general perception on the judicial independence? Uh, do you think it'll affect in any way um, how like mundane cases, like people's perception on their mundane cases might be uh, biased or be um, more persecuted in a way, or like, do you think it is a like totally separate problem in when it comes to people's perception towards judicial? Oh, no, no. I think that people's perceptions are driven by what they hear about in the media, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they never write about, you know, the fact that 90% of the cases are decided based on the law. You know, that's not an interesting story. Uh, instead, all of the stories are about the manipulation of the, of the cases. I mean, the, the, um, the case that Lucia told us about, that, you know, the Russian papers would eat that up. They would, they, you know, you could have a mini series based on just that horrible experience that she had. Um, and so I think that, you know, when people are asked about courts, and this, you know, when I, when I um, do interviews with ordinary people, it always starts with them telling me how the courts are hopeless they would you know that they're that you can't trust them they're terribly corrupt and i sort of let them get that all out of their system and then i say well have you ever been to court mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah and then they tell me about their experience in court well how was that experience and it wasn't always you know uh uh you know rosy uh going to court isn't a pleasant experience for anyone right mm -hmm. um but the reality is is that it, it rarely involved paying bribes it rarely involved the kind of stuff that they see on the front pages of the paper um but that's what drives their their view i think right i mean that's something that's i don't know what data set you could have that could prove that Right. Mm -hmm. um, but if that's all you know about courts, of course, that's what you're going to think the story is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I've seen that over and over again in a, when I do qualitative work. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's why I, as I say, you know, I'm skeptical, say, of the, those Levada data that I put up where they just asked, you know, how much do you trust courts? Well, mm -hmm. we have what, what, four different kinds of courts in Russia, you know, and, and, and I'm not sure Russians, most Russians know that, mm -hmm. that most Russians are aware of, you know, that they even are totally aware of the constitutional court. I think very few Russians understand the arbitrage courts. I mean, when Levada did a, a survey asking what they thought of the merger between the, the higher arbitrage court and the Supreme Court, the answer of most people is that they'd never heard of the higher arbitrage court. They had no idea what it was. And why should they? Right. Why should they know about that? Um, so it's, uh, you know, these these um, opinions are, you know, very noisy. Right. In terms of what are they actually measuring? But mm -hmm. they're what we have. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I'm just trying to see whether or not we can get something interesting out of this question of of whether ordinary ordinary people's views of um, of how they think about the courts. You know, what does that what does that tell us? Yeah. So Maybe one quick follow up question on like what they what, what do people mean by when they answer that courts are independent or not? Do you think uh, they are in their mind, in their mindset, the, the aspect of court and judges, this whole judicial system act as a kind of a constraint on the executive power? Do you think that even pass uh, by their minds when they're answering those questions? I don't think so. Do you? <laughs> I don't know, like based on the textbook and they learn yeah. um, in their textbook. It's like I mean, the only court that really can act as a constraint on the um, on the on the executive branch is the constitutional court. 
And your next speaker is going to be telling us all about that, right? Isn't isn't uh, Professor Trochev going to talk about the Constitutional Court? But I, I think there's no question that it has been its role has been somewhat muted in, under Putin as compared to what it was under Yeltsin. Um, uh, the idea of judicial review is, you know, hasn't really turned out. I think the way a lot of uh, people who had hope in it, you know, thought maybe it would. So. All right, uh, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, sharing with us your um, really helpful insights into how actually people perceive and understand about the um, court system and judicial independence in Russia. It was a very um, uh, detailed work based on the survey and which we really did not really uh, pay attention um, like how actually people perceive about the judicial independence. And I think it is really important question rather than actually measuring the judicial independence per se, but like how like people's perception yeah. of belief itself is constituted is actually right. an important um, part of understanding the whole legal system. Um, okay, thank you very much for the all the audience members to stay with us until the very end. Um, thank you very much, Carly, for organizing this wonderful event. I would like to make a brief note on the uh, the final uh, session of our speaker series event, which is on June 10th. Um, so, uh, as uh, Dr. Kentley mentioned, Dr. Alexei Trocha from Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan uh, will be here on June 10th to talk about the constitutional court in Russia. So if you're interested in this topic, uh, please join us here again on June 10th and we sh I expect to see you all there so soon. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.